delighted to introduce um, Ema Gallagher from RAL Space and Nottingham Trent University, who was awarded the Patricia Tompkins Undergraduate Prize um, this year. And Ema is going to be talking about charming, developing an astronomical heterodyne receiver for the Large Millimeter Telescope. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so I'm Emer. Um, I'm an undergraduate student at Nottingham Trent University, um, and I spent the last year um, as a placement student working at RAL Space within the Millimeter Wave Technology Group. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview um, about where I worked, um, the Large Millimeter Telescope, and um, a bit about our project of developing this receiver here. <coughs> Um, so a lot of you will have heard of uh, Rutherford Afton. Um, I worked within RAL Space. Uh, we're part of the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Um, and this is our campus here. Um, a lot of you will recognise places like Dan Light Source, um, ISIS, Muni, Neutron Source, and things like the Central Laser Facility. Um, so the Millimeter Wave Technology Group uh, mainly specialise in uh, design, development, and manufacture of um, systems operating at millimetre and submillimeter wavelengths. Um, and things like these shock key barrier diodes, which we then put into these precision machined mixer blocks here. Um, and we do an awful lot of our manufacturing in-house. Um, so some of the recent things that the group have worked on, uh, this is a current project, um, the second generation of the MEDOP weather satellites. So currently developing microwave sounder and microwave imager. Um, which will go towards a new generation of weather satellites, will help with weather prediction and climate modelling. Um, and also, uh, a lot of people have heard of ALMA, um, the Millimeter Wave Technology Group at RAL Space um, was part of the front end integration centre and developed an awful lot of the front end receivers for ALMA. Um, so, I'm just going to move on to a short video, kind of giving a bit of a summary of the project that I worked on. Hopefully, I'll get the sound. <coughs> the LED is the large millimeter telescope um, based in Puebla, Mexico. It's the largest single dish spherical millimeter wave telescope in the world. Mm. One of the aims of the LMD is to look at the processes behind the formation and evolution of planetary systems, black holes, galaxies, and stars. <coughs> With the objective of observing several gas molecules, mainly carbon monoxide, in interstellar gas clouds. So the core technology in this instrument is the heterodyne terahertz receiver. So imagine your FM radio in your car. It receives a carrier with that information in it, and it breaks it down to separate the carrier and the information. This is exactly what this does by much higher frequencies. The LMT group has several decades of experience building instruments. We have the accumulated know-how facilities to, to make uh, these, these devices and instruments. And more importantly, we have the team members that can accomplish various tasks. The primary users are going to be radio astronomers from the University of Manchester and our colleagues in Mexico, with the primary objective of observing gas species in the interstellar medium and young star formation. Rasmus has leading experts in millimeter wave technology, and the Aztec project has allowed us to share this information and expertise with engineers in Mexico. There was a lot of acronyms and stuff chucked at you in that video, which I'll try and explain some of now. Um, so the Aztec project uh, was the project that I assigned to. It was assigned to when I started working at RAL Space. Um, I ended up working within quite a small team. That's a picture of us up there. Um, and it's the Astronomical Systems Technology and Engineering Collaboration. 
Um, so this project was uh, funded by uh, the Global Challenge Research Fund um, with the aim of working with a developing nation to improve their science and their technology. Um, so we mainly worked in collaboration with the National Institute of Astrophysics, Optics and Electronics based in Puebla, Mexico, um, along with the University of Manchester and the University of Mexico. Uh, so CHARM, our instrument, um, of course, like all projects, we had to have a nice acronym. So the Collaborative Hedgedown Astronomical Receiver for Mexico. Um, it's a 345 gigahertz instrument and it's pretty much plug and play, um, including software that we developed. Um, and we basically have the front and back end all integrated onto this one optical table. So you can see we've got some spectrometers here and all of our electronics up here. Um, so for those of you who are maybe unfamiliar um, with heterodyne receivers, um, the core component here really is this mixer. Um, so what we do is we take an incoming millimetre terahertz signal and we mix it with a local oscillator signal that is generated in the instrument. Um, this then gives us an intermediate frequency, which is the difference between these two. Um, and this allows it to be much more easily processed. Um, we can use off-the-shelf components, uh, which makes things a lot easier. Um, so this is actually a schematic of charm. Um, my first week working at Rail Space, I was handed this on a piece of paper. Um, so within a year, we actually went from having hand-drawn paper schematics to having a fully functional instrument, um, which is quite a nice thing to be able to witness from start to finish. Um, so you can see here, that is our uh, first stage mixer and our local oscillator here. Um, we then do further down conversion here through a second set of mixers, um, and it's processed with four wideband <coughs> spectrometers, um, and all of our information goes straight through a USB hub to a single laptop, um, which can be remotely <coughs> controlled for people doing observations, um, which is quite a nice way to collect your data. Um, so we're pretty much looking at this millimeter and sub millimeter wave region um, with 345 gigahertz. We're kind of just tipping into this. Um, terahertz region, uh, which is a fairly, it's a field that's been developed fairly recently. Um, you know, it's a lot of things like scanners and airports um, and security applications as well as things like astronomy. Uh, so we're working at the Large Millimeter Telescope in Puebla, Mexico, uh, which is this big telescope here. Um, it's a 50 meter primary dish. Um, it became oper operational in 2018. Um, after completing about seven years of its early science with a 32 meter dish. Um, it's at 4,600 meters altitude on top of an extinct volcano, um, which makes for quite an interesting experience trying to install things um, at, such a high, at such a high altitude. Um, and it's the largest stable single dish millimeter wave telescope in the world. Um, so I was very lucky um, back in October after only working at Rail Space for two months. Um, I got to go out to Mexico um, and do some uh, looking around um, before we started developing the instrument. Um, and you can see from the pictures, it's just a, quite an incredible place to get to visit. Um, we did actually do some work as well. We didn't just take nice pictures outside the whole time. Um, this is the receiver cabin here and the control room of the LMT. So our instrument charm actually kind of had a bit of a predecessor here. Um, this is SHRM, the uh, subharmonic image rejection receiver, um, which was also developed at Rail Space, but mainly for um, uh, atmospheric science. Um, so it had a couple of deployments at Young Friot Observatory in Switzerland. And um, after some lab testing, um, people noticed that it actually really, well, it was really good at picking up the um, 345 gigahertz carbon monoxide um, rotational transition line, um, which of course is very common in the interstellar medium. Um, so they moved on to trying to uh, develop an astronomical receiver, which is what it turned into here. You can see some sort of common, common bits, like this ro rotating mirror here and here, um, and this original sort of breadboard you can see here, um, but an awful lot of it was pretty much an entire instrument upgrade. Um, we added four new uh, wideband spectrometers um, made by Star Dundee. Um, we actually switched it from a, a, a separate sideband system to a double sideband system. 
um, which can cause spectral confusion sometimes when looking at spectra, um, but it was really needed to get the sensitivity that we needed for the instrument. Um, we also newly assembled these uh, down conversion plates with our second stage mixers. Um, so we did an awful lot of testing in the lab before we sent it out to Mexico, and we found that it has a Allen variance of about 10 seconds, um, which is really quite good because it's longer than the stability of the atmosphere at the LMT. So it's a fairly stable and sensitive instrument. Uh, we also developed the software for controlling the instrument um, based in LabVIEW. Uh, we had done this previously for the Sherm instrument, um, which is based on the software done by uh, Stardundee for their spectrometer control. Um, but we wrote in um, position switching and on-the-fly measurements and it is, the software is currently being integrated with the uh, LMT control software, so we will actually be able to do telescope pointing through the instrument. Um, so I'm going to move on to the, a little bit about the objects of the LMT. So you can see here, this is the primary 50 metre dish and secondary up here, which is about 2.5 metres. And if you look at this kind of blue circle in the middle here. Um, that's where the signal um, goes in to the instrument room, which you can see in that picture there. It kind of gives a bit of an idea about the scale of uh, this dish here. Um, so we then used two of the mirrors already installed <coughs> here, um, in order to try and get the signal into the receiver cabin. Um, so we've got like a 1.5 mirror and a one meter uh, mirror here. Um, and really, one of the challenges is that there's already an awful lot of instruments installed at the LMT. Um, so trying to get the signal from here out to <coughs> our allocated bit of space over here um, meant that we also had to um, design and build uh, any coupling objects that we needed. Uh, so we did this by building this kind of odd contraption here. Um, so we used a periscope with two... Um, plain mirrors here and here, um, made just of aluminium tooling plate, um, and we were able to fix these at the angles that we needed to direct the signal in, down, and then out um, to the receiver. We needed lots of warning tape to make sure nobody fell over it. Um, and this then allowed us to go down to our rotating mirror here, which was used previously with the Sherm instrument, um, and this allows us to calibrate with our um, hot calibration target, and then down here a cold calibration target, which is the same as this one but submerged in liquid nitrogen. Um, we then have a small off axis uh, mirror here, then going into the feed horn, which feeds the mixer in here. Um, so we really are going down from the 50 metre um, primary dish to an 8 millimetre feed horn. Um, so it's quite a challenge getting all the optics to line up for that. Um, so a little bit about what charm we'll actually be looking at. Um, I'm not an astrochemist or anything like that. I was very much more on the technical side of things. Um, but we will be looking at these spectral lines and these molecules along the top here. Um, the blue, orange and green lines are the levels of uh, precipitable water vapour at 1, 2 and 4 millimetres. Um, so we wanted really to keep everything within these kind of flatter, um, good transmission areas. So you can see the 345 down here. Um, and this carbon monoxide line um, is likely to be our strongest line observed um, with the instrument. Um, so like I said earlier, we've got two uh, measurement options. Position switching, where we take on and, on and off source sky measurements, um, generally for smaller sources. And then an on the fly mapping um, for larger extended sources. Um, and we're looking at emission from the interstellar medium, um, specifically uh, young star forming regions um, with our uh, principal investigator at the University of Manchester. And hopefully we'll be able to produce some maps similar to this, um, showing outflows from the star forming regions. Uh, this one here in particular has the red lines representing the red shift and blue with blue shift so you can actually, from the spectral lines and the, um, the shift you can then uh, determine the movement of, the, of these regions. 
Um, so one of the big things that we want to look at is the aperture efficiency of the LMT, um, because the LMT hasn't actually been used um, at such a high um, frequency. Um, so this is the first instrument that operates at, at 345 gigahertz um, at the LMT. So uh, the surface of this main dish is made up of 180 segments um, of electroform nickel. Um, these sub-panels, as they're called, are actually really, really big. Um, we got to see some because they're in the process of replacing them. And we got to see some in one of their labs when we were over there. And you have to climb a ladder to get up and around it. So um, it kind of gives you an idea of the scale of this big 50 meter dish. Um, so it's actually an active surface. So the dish can actually compensate for the deformation in the dish as it is moved round, um, which is really good for, it's such a large instrument um, that those deformations really could um, have an impact on the measurements that it's taken. Um, and our plan is to observe unresolved sources um, for kind of pointing and alignment and to try and determine this aperture efficiency. Uh, so a lot of you hopefully will recognise this image here, which is fairly recent. Um, the LMT was actually part of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, um, and it's hoped that the, while, when we figure out the aperture efficiency and how um, effectively the telescope works at that frequency, um, it could result in, a, um, in extending the capabilities of the LMT and their very long baseline interferometry. Uh, so in practice, um, our first observing session didn't go terribly well. Um, we were at the end of an 11-day um, installation trip, um, and we thought that we needed to try and get some sort of measurements. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the last hour that we had up on the mountain, um, and we kept everyone late that day um, trying to get these maps. Um, so these are actually supposed to show Jupiter, um, but as you can see, there's, we, you know, we would have expected a kind of region of higher intensity here in these intensity plots, which you can't really see. Um, but it all became clear when we went outside. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the weather that we had. Um, so unfortunately, we are still hindered by bad weather, just like optical telescopes and stuff like that. Um, but we do have more observing planned for January this year, and hopefully we'll have a little bit better weather. Um, so we successfully completed the installation in September. And uh, we did kind of have first light, um, so that was the first demonstration of the LMT at 345 gigahertz. Um, we really do hope that it will um, add to the very long baseline interferometry capabilities. Um, and in the future, we would really like to carry out a cryogenic upgrade to the system um, and uh, cool the front end of the receiver with liquid nitrogen um, to lower the system noise temperature um, and increase the sensitivity. Um, so I'm just going to finish with a couple of pictures um, from Mexico. Uh, the scenery was absolutely incredible. I'm very lucky that I got to do two trips out there um, during my placement year. Um, it was an absolutely incredible experience. Um, this is a picture here from First Light. Um, and this is a very tired me after 11 days um, trying to get the, um, the instrument installed. This is the point where we had the instrument in place and we decided to take a sharpie out and draw around it on the floor <laughs> to make sure that everything was finally in place and finally all set up. And again, just kind of, not sure how well you can see this, but this is actually the LMT at night, um, the surface of the dish. <laughs> yeah. um, and finally, just some thanks um, to RAL Space and my colleagues there, um, the people that we worked with at the LMT, um, and our collabor collaborators in the University of Manchester and finally to the Royal Astronomical Society for inviting me to come and speak here and also um, yeah, for the undergraduate prize and Patricia Tompkins as well um, for funding these opportunities. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Ema, for a fantastic talk, and congratulations again on your prize. That was really great. What an amazing experience you've had. Um, time for a few questions. Any questions from, from the audience?
You were funded by the GCRF. Um, what was the role of Mexico in your collaboration? Um, so it was mainly a knowledge transfer program. Um, so we actually had um, an engineer from the LMT in Mexico who came and worked at RAL Space for a couple of months and then go back to Mexico and then a couple of months in the UK as well. And we kind of swapped over. Um, it was mainly training by us um, for staff at the LMT um, because very often their instruments are developed by outside groups and brought in. Um, and this was kind of an opportunity for staff at the LMT to learn how, to, how they could develop their own instrumentation. Sounds like you had a great time. Yes. <laughs> so, so, I, I, so the first question would have been, did you enjoy yourself? But doing a one-year undergraduate placement in astronomy is quite unusual. I don't think I've heard of that before. So has it affected the way you see your future career in any way? Yes, very definitely. Um, so yeah, I was very lucky to um, get that year placement at RAL Space. Um, I'm an astrophysics student at, at Nottingham Trent, and uh, it, I had no experience of heterodyne receivers or anything like that. Didn't know very much about millimeter wave technology at all when I started. Um, so it really has been quite a learning experience over kind of the last year, um, and it has very definitely changed the way I thought about things. Um, and I'm quite lucky that I've been offered a job back at RAL Space. Um, so I will definitely be staying in the millimetre wave technology field and hopefully continuing with astronomical instrumentation. Any more questions? Yes. I was just wondering what the tuning range of your receiver is and can you exploit the full width of the atmospheric transmission window, which must be quite um, wide from that site? Yes, yeah, so our um, local oscillator, um, we can tune that from 316 to about 360 gigahertz, um, so we can actually do that bit of tuning. Um, but our main focus at the minute is at the 345 region, just to see how well the LMT works. Yeah, sounds really impressive. Thanks. Mm -hmm. One more final question. Okay, if not, then thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.